Good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, as you know, please just drop me a one in the chat to let me know that I've got decent audio because that's always the one thing that I mess up. Everything should be fine, but uh, yeah, you just never know. So yeah, looks like we're live and I, I guess things are looking positive with the audio. Uh, I'm just checking a comment and... Yep, so anyway, <laughs> so hey everyone, um, I've got Stewards Impact Church, welcome, Pro-Life Chloe, welcome, Eva, Eric Montas, Moon T, Sustain Christ, Time Phaser, James Alexander, uh, Just Janice, and Stephen Young, and Mr. Malachlechla. Welcome, great to see someone from South Africa. So yeah, today we're talking about Darwin. I, I know it's kind of short notice, I gave like two and a quarter hours notice. But I will be doing this talk with uh, Kennedy Hall on Thursday, just before I do my talk with Sam Shamoon on Thursday. Zach Zakis, welcome. Kush, Joel, Ungas, Historical Christianity, welcome. So I thought I'd best run this on my channel because I, I would prefer to have something on my channel first before I do it on a different channel. Cassandra Hall, uh, Ball, no, Cassandra Ball, hello from Alberta, Canada, welcome. It's been a long time since I visited Canada. Yeah, I was on the left coast many years back. All right. Okay, so let's let's just dive in here. And wait. <laughs> Jimmy Berman, Yeshua Akbar. Yes. Oh, by the way, I did mention this to some people a couple of days ago on my last stream. But this is something that is of interest to people who are curious about the origins of Protestantism and curious about just the history of the church. And... This is a really interesting article. I've been looking for something good, and I found this one, and I've managed to, be, on the basis of this, find some other articles that discuss this history. But this is a real question that arose during the Protestant Reformation. Where was your church before Luther? And this is claims for the antiquity of Protestantism examined. Now, of course, you know that <laughs> recently uh, Luther got thrown on the bus as a minor aspect of Protestantism, which apparently stands on its own because it's right there, you know, like Sola Scriptura and Protestantism is right there in the Bible in Isaiah 42, right next to Muhammad, right? So with the, with the removal or minimization of Luther's influence, like Luther had no effect on Protestantism, Luther was a minor part, his theology, you know, didn't come from him, it came from people before him, namely Wycliffe, John Waldo from the Waldensians, and of course from Jan Hus, this is a claim that, that needs to be then proven, right? Needs to be needs to be demonstrated. But what is very interesting, when you read the history of the Protestant church, of the claims that were made in the 15th, 16th, 7, well, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, about the even up to the 19th century, as to the origins and the history of the Protestant church, saying, yes, we have a lineage, uh, an apostolic succession going back to Jesus and the apostles. In every single case, the Protestant church at several points goes through major heresies. They name, literally name, major heresies as founders of Protestantism, so that they go through these lineages that include flaming heretics. Not, maybe they're not heretics, maybe they are flaming heretics, right? And then, of course, at the, these churches would change their story. One month they're saying one thing, and next year they're saying another thing. So the story is inconsistent. It constantly changes. Every single Protestant denomination did this, they were all doing it. They were they were making up myths. None of them can agree on the myth. And of course, they were changing their own myths from from day to day, which means there's, an, there's, a, there's a massive inconsistency. They can't prove it. And also, when they choose, yeah, this group, well, actually, yeah, this group was the, was early Christians and we tie ourselves to them. Then they discover these guys are heretics and suddenly they've got to toss them under the bus and they've got to choose another group. Or they realize that the theology of that particular group is actually is actually against their theology, runs contrary to their theology, then they've got to pick someone else. And it's a, it's an utter joke, to be quite blunt. It's a complete and utter joke. So, And Catholic apologists, it says here, very interestingly, Catholic apologists usually designated Luther and Calvin as Manichaean heretics. And there's a lot of substance to that. From the third century dualist heresy of Manis, okay? And this heresy carried over into the uh, Albigensians. And it's interesting that every single Protestant denomination at some point called the Albigensians, who are flaming heretics, their Protestant pr 
progenitus. <laughs> it's hysterical. I mean, it's it's a complete and utter joke. All right, is a flaming heretic worth more than a regular old heretic? They they they're a lot more fun to look at. At least they light up the night, right? So so anyway, like I mean, it's just it's just I'm looking at this history and it, it's 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 a riot. Okay, so yeah, so this is something I will be doing um, soon. I'll probably do this with Sam, but I really need to go through this. And it, it's, I'd love to see someone present me a, a coherent narrative of the apostolic succession of the Protestant churches. Even the worst offender here is probably the Baptist Church, which embraces every heresy known to man, down to the first century, to claim that it is truly apostolic, right, and truly the first church. But here's another thing. In many cases, they would embrace fideism, like sola fide and sola scriptura. They were forced to abandon the historical approach and adopt the we're in the Bible right next to Muhammad in Isaiah 42 approach because there was zero, zero historical proof of their existence down to the first century. None. Absolutely none. It was a complete joke. I mean, if, if you've got 200 churches with 200 completely contradictory histories, and next week they have a different story, and the week after that another story. I mean, clearly someone's lying to you, right? So they had to then choose. Well, 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 we're in the Bible, because they could not prove anything factually. So they had to make assertions about Scripture. So that's the reason for we're in the Bible. We're Bible Christians. This is where that idea comes from. So how can you have solar two different things exactly? But Anyway, Dan. So uh, let's let's leave this behind. I will I will be coming to this soon. So I've I've read the whole thing. You can see here on the left hand side. I've 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 gone through the whole thing. I've highlighted all the major points. I'm not sure that I'll make a presentation. I might, um, but I might just go through the document. But it's hysterically funny. Okay, today's topic: Darwin and evolution. We're going to be talking about eugenics and scientific genocide. If you want to ask. Who is the father of scientific genocide? I'll be very happy that you did. Because the name of the father of scientific genocide is Charles Darwin. This man right here. He is our father of scientific genocide. Ricky Brown, welcome. <clears throat> and of course, Darwin published two books in 1859 and 1871. He published, you know, well, the second book was called The Descent of Man. And yeah, Darwin certainly did enable the descent of man. James Alexander, the five souls, like I tell my wife, I only want one thing, that being a pizza, a massage, a beer, and maybe a burger and some fries, just one thing. Yeah, exactly. But let's continue, okay? And finally, Darwinism is explicitly anti-Christian. You need to understand this. So this is not me discussing evolution. This is not the point of this discussion. You need to understand this movement, this Darwinian ideology, is explicitly anti-Christian. It was designed to destroy Christianity. And as a Christian, you need to know this so that you can use this knowledge to push back hard against this. Okay, so lie to me, Darwin. So let's learn about Darwin as a little boy, right? Now, Darwin published online, you can find about 9,000 of Darwin's own letters, books, diaries in his own handwriting. He published about 13,000. I don't think all of them are available, but I have been going through Darwin's own works. It's called darwin-online.co.uk or something, and you can search through them. So, Darwin writes in his own, this is Darwin himself, I acted cruelly, for I beat a puppy, I believe, simply from enjoying the sense of power. But the beating could not have been severe, for the puppy did not howl. Well, as you know, scientists regularly beat puppies as children because that's what you do, right? And then Darwin tells us, but he goes on, and of course, this is where apologists for Darwin will say, well, you are quoting that out of context because he says he did, he did it only once. Yeah, and if you kill someone just once, you're not a murderer, right? Because there's only one murder, right? But Darwin says then he only did it the once and he never did it again but then he also tells us in that <laughs> in his writing he goes on to tell us i may here also confess that as a little boy i was much given to inventing deliberate falsehoods in other words he was a liar he admits to lying regularly as a child so how are we to know that he only beat one puppy because we're going to find out darwin murdered killed a lot of animals he loved killing animals with his hands 
And this was always done, my lying was always done for the sake of causing excitement. And he says, I sometimes stole fruit for the sake of eating it, but then other times he would steal fruit to give to certain neighbors so that the neighbors would give him praise. I remember stealing apples from the orchard, right? And he would then steal these apples, take it to some neighbors and give it to them so that they would praise him for how smart and how amazing and how wonderful he was. I became passionately fond of shooting. I do not believe that anyone could have shown more zeal for the most holy cause than I did for shooting birds. For Darwin, it was a most holy cause to kill birds. Later on, he decided it wasn't good enough to shoot birds. He had to get a hammer and smash their brains in. Or get rocks and stone them to death. But, you know, sometimes shooting things, you need to get a little closer, get your hands dirty, right? Full of blood. But that was, that's Darwin. And remember, he did it for science. Hello, Kathy Hopkins. You can beat women, but bruises can be, can't be seen. Isn't beating the cult? We all know. Yeah, well. So, how well I remember. He says, how well I remember killing my first snipe. And my excitement was so great that I had much difficulty in reloading my gun from the trembling of my hands. This taste long continued. Now, Sister in Christ says, serial killing mental yeah, patients often starts with animals. Thank you for noticing. Yes, serial killing mentality often starts with animals. He does tell us in his own writing how I did enjoy shooting. But I think that I must have been half consciously ashamed of my zeal, for I tried to persuade myself that shooting was, an, was almost an intellectual employment. So killing things, and he loved to kill things. This wasn't just like a once-off here. He was excited about it. He writes on <laughs> endlessly about killing things. It was almost an intellectual employment. I tried to persuade myself this is intellectual. No, he just liked killing things. It required so much skill to judge where to find most game and to hunt the dogs well. My zeal was so great that I used to place my shooting boots open by my bedside when I went to bed so as not to lose half a minute in putting them on in the morning. So apologists will... I, I put this quote about the puppy first because apologists will lose their minds about using it out of context this, the, the thing is, there's lots of context to add to this to explain why Darwin realized maybe killing a puppy would make him look bad. Maybe killing the neighbor's puppy or your dad's puppy would, wouldn't look so good. So you go and kill animals that no one would miss. And Muhammad started with the lizards and dogs. Yes, Maxim. Correct. Let's continue. This is from Lawrence R. Croft. He's a former research scientist. And he wrote this book called The Life and Death of Charles Darwin. Darwin presented himself as a humane naturalist, yet at the same time he had a passion for killing game with the shotgun. He also enjoyed demonstrating his skill at being able to kill birds, small mammals and rabbits by hurling rocks at them. In other words, he, well, his son Francis noted that Darwin was good at killing animals in this way. He was really good at killing animals with rocks. His zeal and excitement about killing, as you have pointed out, wow, yeah, I... Why did we not learn this in school about Darwin? How come all those wonderful documentaries don't mention that Darwin loved killing animals? But we'll, we'll go further. I want to present Darwin in a way that you've never seen before. We're not here to discuss evolution, whatever. We, we are going to talk about evolution, but I'm not here to do a scientific survey of that. We're going to look at other things. But is he coming across as a little bit psycho already? Because I've done a lot of reading on this, and he comes across as a little... Ooh, Okay, we'll talk more. So, his passion for hunting was so great that Darwin had much difficulty waiting until the hunting season to stalk his prey. To solve this problem, he weighed the financial penalties for killing game out of season. And after considering the fact that no common person or gamekeeper can demand your hunting certificate without producing their own, he thought about ignoring the law and hunting out of season. So I'm not sure if he did, but I'm assuming that at some point he hunted out of season on his own, that he went hunting anyway. On the HMS Beagle voyage, he continued to actively shoot animals whenever the opportunity arose. When the ship landed on the Brazilian coast, Darwin had a marvelous morning, whooping, you, and killing birds with abandon. So Darwin, this great naturalist, this great animal scientist, this great whatever the heck he was, loved killing animals. And why didn't it, I thought he carefully studied, observed, made drawings, 
did science, but no, no, he, he threw them to death with stones and rocks. So, yeah, Darwin thought that Gannett and Turn were such stupid animals that he said, I could have killed any number of them with my geological hammer. Now, by that, he doesn't mean, in theory, I could have. What he means, I lost count of how many of these birds I killed with my geological hammer. His little tiny geological hammer. Behavior that reminds me of the behavior that led to the extinction of one of the most common birds in America, the American passenger pigeon. How many birds Darwin killed with his hammer, he did not say, but regardless of the number, this is a brutal way to kill an animal. So, yeah, let's continue. Fitzroy, who was on the boat, or I think the captain or something, wrote that Darwin picked up his hammer and began killing the peaceful birds and away went the hammer with all the force of his own right arm. Darwin displayed particular delight in harassing the sea and land iguanas. Both types struck him as stupid. He pulled the land iguana by the tail simply to see its shocked reaction. And I opened the stomach of several, Darwin wrote, of both types, and found them full of vegetable fibers. So he did not get along, the captain on the boat or whatever, Fitzroy, didn't get along with him. Darwin's love of killing extended to humans, at least those persons that he regarded as primitive humans, or what he called cannibals. When Darwin learned he was able to go on the exploration trip on the Beagle, he excitedly told a school friend, It is such capital fun ordering things. Today I ordered a rifle and two pair of pistols, for we shall have plenty of fighting with those damned cannibals. It would be something to shoot the king of the cannibals' islands. So I'm going to hunt me some... Uh, Debbie, wow, thank you very much. That's really um, grateful. Thank you. So, not interested in his personal state of mind, only science. Sorry. So, what does that mean, John Doe? What does that mean? So, uh, yeah, wonderful guy. So, we'll continue with his personal state of mind as an inbreeder and eugenicist. Yeah, because as you know, science is pure and science is beautiful and it's satanic too, as we're going to discover. It's, it's pretty filthy. Right, he goes on. Later, the chief of police of police begged Fitzroy to help quell a riot by the local Negroes. Fitzroy sent 50 well-armed soldiers to make peace with them. Darwin followed and secretly longed to swish a cutlass or put a dagger between his teeth and to join in the fighting. The Negroes, though, capitulated easily, way too easily for Darwin, because Darwin was very disappointed in not seeing any gunfire or any violence. So there you go. Great scientist man. Great scientist man wanted to shoot him some, you know, Shoot him some of these dudes. So, <clears throat> yep. So, let's see. I've never heard any of this before. They never talk about the man. Well, I'll, Ill, well, ask yourself why. <laughs> ask yourself why. It doesn't get any better. It's This is Darwin we're talking about. So, they do that on purpose. They hide everything behind cover. Yeah, John Doe. You should read Thomas Kuhn for an understanding of how the character of scientists corrupts science. Correct. And just like the character of Martin Luther or the character of Calvin corrupted their theology. But look, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about that in the future. Shooting, death, dogs, and catching rats. His sporting enthusiasms even included some of the most violent and inhumane of all sports, fox hunting, using killer dogs. Now, one wonders if Darwin's passion for killing and death might have played a part in developing his ruthless survival of the fittest red tooth and claw theory of natural selection in which death became a positive force for good so you must understand this is going to lead us towards eugenics and this is going to lead us towards obviously malthusian ideas but for darwin death was one of the greatest things because it brought forth good in other words when you kill the primitive races when you murder the primitive races you have more stuff for you as the advanced higher races so, Unga says, I knew that Darwin is a degenerate, but I didn't know that he's a psychopath. Yeah. So, look, there are very few sources that talk about this, right? So, we need to be careful here. But that said, there's probably a good reason why they have not investigated this in depth, because this would start to destroy the image of the man, because they want to put forward this, this great scientific image. And if we start digging, what else will we find? So, Fortuna Martino says, all of them are basically evil people. Yes. So, there's something evil going on here. But we'll learn more. A very nasty view in a way. Yeah, SDRC, explain that a bit more. I'd be curious to know your thinking on that. Darwin viewed death and destruction as an engine of evolutionary progress. 
as we see in the penultimate sentence of the origin of species. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely, the production of the higher animals, directly follows. So in other words, from the war of nature, from famine and from death, and when he says death, he means warfare, he means killing. The most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, the higher animals, and who are the highest of the animals? Us, man. So the production of the higher animals follows. In other words, we had to destroy the lesser to come forth. We had to clear the brush, clear the deadwood, clear the inferior, get rid of the weak, get rid of the sick, get rid of what we consider less than us, and then our greatness could expose itself. This is a very dangerous mindset, as we will learn. He glorified death, and instead of the biblical enemy, death became our creator, a force for evolutionary progress. So for Darwin, death is a force for development. It's a force for progress. Kill thy neighbor so that thou might take his stuff, and then you will, you will continue, right? The survival of the fittest. Furthermore, death was also significant because Darwin taught that the elimination of the weak was required to promote the progress of every species. So ever says our characters shape our life and how we live and vice versa. Those things go in pairs and you cannot separate them as mind shapes your work, your actions affect your mind. And that is so true. That is very well stated. Thank you. Yeah. Let's continue. So Munti says that's Hitler's mindset without a doubt. And as we will discover, Darwin is reflecting Hitler's mindset. Hitler is simply quoting Darwin. Hitler studied Darwin and Hitler's actions are very much 100% aligned with Darwin. Hitler wasn't being crazy. Hitler was being scientific. In fact, specifically, Hitler was being Darwinist. So this is from the book. This is a quote here. So things came to a head in the summer of 1827 when Dr. Robert Darwin realized his son was unsuited for medicine. So apparently the guy was a clueless idiot at university. He had some serious issues, okay? He wasn't the brightest tool in the shed. After much thought, he decided to arrange for him to be trained for the Anglican ministry. This was surprising, as both he and his father before him were self-declared atheists. So Darwin's father was a devout atheist, as was his grandfather. One should bear in mind, however, that at the time, the Anglican church offered not so much as a vocation, but a respectable profession. So in other words, if you were an idiot, if you were the runt of the litter, right? if you were the dumb one in the family, they just sent you off to the seminary to become a priest, because... That's what you did with a dude that just didn't have a clue, okay? So you took the idiot, shoved him off to the seminary, sem seminary, and he became a priest, and he had a job, he had an income, and life was good. Because he wasn't good for anything else. Matthew, thank you very, very much. Let me just check the comments. So death being a positive force for good based on superiority seems Gnostic. Well, yeah, Hitler lashed his brains out. Proof is wrong. Uh, so, okay, so let me continue here. So according to, okay... Accordingly, in the autumn of 1827, Charles Darwin found himself at Christ College, Cambridge. Now, people love to claim he was Christian. People love to claim that, no, he was really a good Christian. That is absolutely untrue. And we'll see it in Darwin's own words. Like I said, I've been studying the database. I've been going through references. And this, this is, Darwin was an atheist. Okay, the man was an atheist. And um, in fact, I'm not going to quote the whole book, because obviously I'm not going to quote like 300 pages here. But he goes on, he goes here and he says, so he was given, he came from a wealthy family. He was given the finest education money could buy back in the day at the finest universities in the world. And in the words of his father told him, Darwin, you care, not, you care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching. So his father tells him the only things you care about is killing things with guns, dogs, because the dogs can hunt and kill things for him, rip them apart, and catching rats. Now, why would Darwin want to catch rats? What was he doing with rats? Because... Psychopaths are known to catch rats and mice and cut them open, but okay, but fine, he catches rats. Darwin goes on to say in the next paragraph, in the same book, he talks about how he spent his time, the four years that he spent there, getting drunk and killing things. He went hunting, killing things, and getting drunk with his buddies. The guy was not exactly studying the Bible like a good little biblical Christian. He was spending most of his time just getting drunk. All right, so Blue Steel, the many faces of Darwin, all in the name of science. Yeah, he was getting drunk at seminary in the name of science. All right, so let's let's examine the, the very... Someone mentioned something that I often mention people's faces and what I see in the faces, and, and they said it's probably because I worked in the security industry and I had to study people's faces to look for intent, to look for danger. And that was a really 
that was a really smart comment. That was a really insightful comment because that was my job to, to observe the environment and make sure that no one kills me or anyone else around me or hurts anyone. So, so that is probably true. Faces tell me something. Munti says nonsense. Though. When a Christian, the Muslims in Pakistan claim that one, that the one that burned to the ground, churches and houses weren't them, but some German dude. Yeah, of course. So look at this face. Look at this. Look at the tension in the man. Then if you can see the tension and look at that face, look at those tortured eyes. Okay. Kathy Hopkins says, who, knowing how much pleasure killing animals gave one, wouldn't be concerned about that person making a career of medicine? Pretty frightening, even for an atheist. Yeah. Well, yeah. Look at the face. Look at those eyes. Those haunted eyes. This is Darwin again. Look at this. Those haunted eyes. Those, that, that thousand yards stare. He looks constipated. Darwin probably was constipated. He was a very sickly man. Martin Luther was an incredibly sick man. Okay. Martin Luther, if you read his historical records, was extremely sick. Okay. And they, they try to obviously present him as a big, strong, hearty man. But no, he was, he was sickly. He was in pain. He was suffering. Darwin too. People don't realize Darwin was not only physically unwell, but mentally unwell. Hitler as well, oddly enough, if you go study some of his history. So maybe Darwin also had a lot of cats in his bin. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so you see, I mean, look at this empty thousand yard stare, this look of regret or something. This, this whatever, this far away stare. He's seeing hell. Yeah. Look at that. This is a dead stare there's something missing in those eyes now you could say well you know back in the day when you took a photograph you had to sit there for 45 minutes well yeah sure whatever maybe not all of the time but there's something wrong in these eyes have a look at that these are dead eyes this is a man traumatized and again right and then we come here just look at those eyes there's something wrong with this face now people also don't realize the brokenness of the man. Yes, the brokenness of man. Rachel Zetsevich. Yes. Yeah, Toto, I mean, we, we can't prove that. I don't know about that. But but let's just say the guy was, um, he certainly was, he kept it in the family. Let's just put it that way. So Darwin actually was beardless. Okay, let me just go back to this picture. Darwin was actually beardless until his 50s. It's only once he entered his 50s that he started growing a beard because he wanted to be anonymous. After the publication of his book and the backlash and the effect that it had, he grew the beard to become anonymous and hide himself. So this was his way of hiding so no one would recognize him. So physicians have one of the highest rates of psychopathy of any field. They joined the SS seven times higher than any other profession. Oh my gosh. That's crazy stuff. Okay. So there's Darwin. I mean, so this is the last photo of Darwin before he died. He was clean shaven his entire adult life. In 1862, at the age of 53, he grew a beard to avoid being recognized. Right? So, good disguise at Christmas time. Yeah, so let's continue. So, Darwin did not discover evolution. I know there's the claim, but Darwin did not. He, just like Marx, did not create socialism. Marx developed his own brand, his own flavor of socialism. Darwin did not invent evolution. Darwin simply created his version of evolution. Yeah, so Rachel says, there is the crazy eyes in the beardless picture. Well, yeah. So finally looked like a chimpanzee. He did. Welcome, Michelle. So Darwinian evolution by natural selection promotes development of life from non-life by purely natural processes. Something that these scientists have a very hard time explaining. How does non-life evolve from material processes, just from matter, right? From non-life. It is one of the most destructive ideas in history, right? So Darwin's theory, Darwinian evolution, not evolution, Darwinian evolution is one of the most destructive, most toxic ideas in history. The idea of evolution was around at least two generations before Charles Darwin even in his own secularist, atheist, enlightenment family. So the idea of evolution was in Darwin's family for decades before Darwin. But in fact, the idea went back much further before Darwin. But his family was staunch evolutionists of the type. What he did was he gave it the trappings of science. Well, in Stuart and Ernesto, welcome. His grandfather, Erasmus, had promoted the idea, as had many others prior to Charles, right? And they'd, so, 
oh, sorry, his grandfather Erasmus had promoted the as had many others prior to Charles back to the pagan Greeks in the third century BC. You can even go back to before the third century BC, but the idea of evolution as Darwin promoted it, as we will see, goes back to the pagan Greeks of third century BC. And these were atheists and they would use it to legitimize atheist philosophy. Okay. Um, sorry, I think I typed that very badly. I need to go back and redo that sentence. Okay. But his idea can be traced back to the third century BC by these Greek pagan atheists. And they were using this idea of evolution to legitimize atheist philosophy as opposed to atheistic philosophy. They had to come up with an opposition to theistic evolution, right? Because back then you had people saying, well, God made the world or the gods or Zeus or whomever, Apollo, whatever, they made the world. But of course now they had to come up with their own atheistic evolution to compete. Darwinism is not evolution. It is a deliberately atheistic, godless version of evolution. Make the distinction. So Darwinism is an atheistic, godless version of evolution. Social Darwinism is not a corrupted form of Darwinism. Social Darwinism is Darwinism. Everyone says, well, his cousin Francis Galton invented social Darwinism and corrupted Dar Nonsense. Social Darwinism is regular Darwinism. Darwin made atheism and science synonymous with the rejection of religion. Darwin is in the Western world, in the modern era, He's the guy that said science and atheism go together and you have to reject religion. Eric Montes says he had a pet cemetery at his home. Yeah, who knows how many animals he buried. XYZ, welcome. So according to Darwin, morality is whatever helps one group to survive or compete against another. So in other words, we have no innate morality because there's no creator. There is no innate morality. There is no logos. There's no God of the world that has a natural law, a moral law. And therefore, what is moral for one group may not be moral for another. A set of rules that helps group A survive may have a completely set of different standards for group B and for group C and for group D. Understand? So whatever helps group survive, that is morality. So that becomes incredibly subjective. So eugenics culminating in Nazi programs, found full justification in Darwin's writing. Darwin's writing 100% unambiguously supports both the Nazi program and the eugenics program. Darwin's son, Leonard, became a leading eugenicist. His sons got into the eugenics movement in a big way. Not just the one son, all of them. <clears throat> but Darwin's son, Leonard, became a leading eugenicist. right? And eugenicists, um, so the term for eugenics, you can also call it racial hygiene, Right, because if you've got skin like this, you're supposed to be unclean, right? You're you're bringing um, an impure strain into the into the race, right? And also scientific racism. So yeah, there's science again. Maybe we should ban science. Science created a lot of nasty things that that go boom and uh, yeah, atheist contribution to science, according to Nobel Prize winner, 16% Christian, 65%. Yeah, exactly, EMB. Yeah, and of course, atheists have given us scientific racism and eugenics. But we'll continue. We'll see, we'll see how fantastic this stuff goes. Darwin's theory came before the facts. His theory was not based on facts. You will see that, that the idea that they had right, existed long before Darwin. He was finding a way to make it legitimate, to legitimize it. So his idea came not from careful examination of scientific evidence. Darwin's science, right, his argument for natural selection, was a deliberate attempt to exclude and displace God from the natural world completely. Darwin set out to destroy God. He set out to remove God completely from the universe. That was Darwin's intention. Scientific justification of psychopathy. So this is called the Darwin myth, the life and lies of Charles Darwin. Right? It's by Benjamin Weicker. I've read quite a bit of Benjamin Weicker. So yeah. Nietzsche, Marx, Hitler, and Stalin all warmly welcomed Darwin's ideas. Darwin's ideas were influenced by various sources, including Thomas Malthus. I won't go into depth on Thomas Malthus, but Thomas Malthus basically said that uh, the population is growing and we're running out of resources and everyone's going to die unless we, I don't know, abort everybody and we just, we're just never gonna, we're never going to survive. Of course, we are technologically, because we have such brilliant ideas and technology, we are entering, we have entered an age of superabundance. The earth can hold many, many more times people than it has. 
the earth has so much resources and we've got better technology to develop these resources to provide. So Malthus is wrong, but these people are, on, are an apocalyptic death cult. They're Gnostics with an apocalyptic death cult. So they, they have these crazy ideas. The Enlightenment goal of eliminating religion by disparagement was the cause of people like Darwin searching for evidence to support it. These Enlightenment ideas were part of his family prior to Darwin, so he, especially his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. Maivart criticized Darwin, accusing him of presenting a flawed dichotomy that forced a choice between either evolution or creationism without considering any other possibilities. Because at the time, science was looking at a wide variety of, of ideas as to how do we reconcile the biblical account with the idea of creation. So there was a lot of debate going on, and science was growing, and the popular view was a kind of theistic evolution, so a sort of a, a synthesis between the two. And Darwin, is, Darwin created this flawed dichotomy of this side or that side, either creation or science. Either you go... The earth was made 25 minutes ago by God, complete, or, you know, no development, just, you know, just poof, there it was, or there was the whole evolutionary idea. So, SDRC, 1% of people use more than double the resources, bottom 50%. Yeah, and, and, I mean, you know, some people think a lot harder than dumb people, but, and, doesn't matter. There's plenty of resources. So, Gray, Lyle, Wallace, and Maivart were trying to understand evolution. They, one, they knew that the Earth was old, right? They knew the Earth is a very old thing, 13 billion years or whatever. They knew Earth was old. Two, they understood the fossil record. Three, they understood the power of Darwin's theory of natural selection. So they understood Darwin's theory. They understood what the fossil record implied. They understood that the Earth could not have been created in 20 minutes, right? Darwin had a different aim, though. Darwin was attempting to establish Darwinism, which removed God. The whole point of Darwin was to kill God. The principle of natural selection was chosen because it excluded any creative action by God. But that is why Darwin was so upset with Lyle, Wallace, and Gray, because these scientists, who were also religious, kept letting God back in. These scientists kept saying, hold on, but... There's, there's, there's a theistic element to this. So Darwin wanted his own religion and he got it. Yeah, this was creation. The, this is the creation myth for atheists, right? This is creation. Atheists needed a creation myth and they got it from Darwin. Thomas Malthus, 1798, Hysteria Science. Malthus argued that population grows exponentially while resources increase at a slower rate, leading to competition for limited resources. This competition would result in a struggle for survival with only the fittest individuals able to reproduce and pass on their traits to the next generation. And he says, population grows exponentially, but water and food do not. Well, there's a very common saying that population grows exponentially, but water and food do not. So in other words, this is like the growth of population, but this is the growth of food and water. And eventually when the two cross, yeah, you're going to have too many people, too little resources. They will fight. There will be this whole Darwinian clash and... Only some will survive to be able to cope within the limits of the resources. That idea has been proven false over and over and over and over. Let's have a look. Population growth will outpace availability of resources leading to famine, disease, and other forms of population control. Malthus argued that without checks on population growth, the world would face scarcity and suffering. So yes, population. So Joel Thomas, you said, let me guess, would genocide and eugenics be their answer? Yes, of course. They just called it population control, right? Yeah, Malthus assumed that people live in a fish tank and not a dynamic and ever-changing world and that, that we are nothing more than the dumb animals, which is why, yeah. The so now this was Malthusius, this was Malthus' idea. Here's time, here's quantity, resources. This was resource growth. This was population growth. And at the point where they intersected, the population would run short of resources and people would die from starvation. People would die from lack of resources. The issue is not the lack of resources. The issue is the distribution of resources. But the distribution of resources is not because the nasty white people of Europe aren't giving the poor black people their fair share, because that's also a bogus argument. I will admit there are two white guys that are responsible for the poverty in Africa. Their names are, their names are Marx and Lenin. Those two white guys are responsible for the poverty in Africa. 
when they actually do a talk about that, how Marx and Lenin are the only two guys that, and besides the fact that tribalism and the refusal by black Africans to adopt Western mindsets, Western education, Western methods, but remain stuck in so many ways in primitive African thinking keeps them down, keeps them behind us. They're, they are their own worst enemies in terms of the way that they need to make that shift into a scientific Western mindset, but they don't. But we'll talk about that in the future. So let's look at world food production. So currently, this is back to 2010 from the Food and Agriculture Organization. David Lamb, How the World Survived the Population Bomb, University of Michigan Population Studies Center, 2011. Total food production is here at, at three. Okay, this is from 1961 to 2009. 1961 is the baseline, that's 100. So the population grew to 220 until 2009, but the food production is 313. We produce more food and more resources than we can properly give to people. So we actually have far more people. And also the simple fact is population doesn't grow. It's only population's falling right now. So <clears throat> now have a look. Annual growth rate of the world population. Malthus was basically thinking that people would just keep having babies and it just would not stop and just and you'd outstrip resource production. He didn't realize technology would solve a lot of our problems. Uh, tribalism, I saw it in Kenya. Yeah, you'll see it in Africa. I'm from Africa too. This was massive population drop up to the year 2000. So see, resource availability and suddenly population drops. So the lack of babies is what's causing a problem in the West. So now, now there is a sop to religion which Darwin attached to later editions of the original species. One of the reasons that people claim that Darwin was Christian, right? And this little sop to religion that he made is used to deny Darwin's atheism. Now, the first edition ended with the famous flourish. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. So Darwin writes some nice flowery words and he says, to smooth, ruffled religious feathers, because don't forget that you had a very Victorian, very conservative era, with lots of religious people. He couldn't afford to alienate and upset everybody. Darwin wasn't confrontational. He let other people do the fighting for him. He was a bit of a sneaky, passive-aggressive kind of guy. Right? To smooth, ruffled religious feathers, later editions read, there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the Creator, into a few forms or into one. So originally said, having been originally breathed into a few forms into one, kept it vague, but then he, in the later edition, he added breathed by the creator. So this line was used to say, hey, Darwin's a Christian. He's not an atheist, you know, because the atheists love to deny that crazy people like Stalin, Hitler, Mao, you know, Pol Pot are atheists because atheism is the religion of peace, right? Demek, hi everyone. Oh, from Cape Town. Nice. Good to see you. Great to see you. So Hitler did use this playbook from Darwin. So no, some are fooled by the SOP even to this day. What did Darwin himself say about this little edition? What, what did Darwin say about it? He was pressured into doing it for social reasons. And let's see what he had to say. He told his friend Hooker, I have long regretted that I truckled to public opinion and used a Pentateuchal term of creation. The Pentateuch is the five books of the, the Torah, basically, the Old Testament. See? And I regret that I gave into public opinion and used a biblical term for creation, by which I really meant appeared by some wholly unknown process. He would not at any point admit that God would do creation. This, would, this went against his ideology completely. Right? Now, so OA text says that this is why the Catholic Church does not have an issue against evolution in principle as a scientific theory, but Darwinism is a different thing, correct? Because theistic evolution was a very common idea at the time. So it was certainly a very common idea. But so there was this, they're trying to make a synthesis of the, the biblical account with science. And the church is very much for reason, although I will, as I will discuss and annoy people again in the near future, Martin Luther was absolutely against the use of reason. But that's a different story, different day. In a letter to Lyell, I would give absolutely nothing for the theory of natural selection if it requires miraculous additions at any stage of descent. So if God was required to make natural selection work, he didn't want it. He didn't want God. He did 
want, you wanted nothing to do with God. You wanted nothing to do with God in terms of creation. Science was anti-God. Science eliminated God. He says, I think embryology, homology, classification shows us that all vertebra, vertebrata have descended from one parent. How that parent appeared, we know not. So he contradicts this statement here, breathed by the creator in his own writing. Right, so I'm just going to show you that here. So this is from Darwin Online. I strongly recommend that. Let me just go back here and just do this again. Oh, here we go. This is Darwin Online. As I said, they've got about 9,000 of Darwin's works available here, his letters to, to people back and forth. Okay, and um, so you can find this here. And he mentions here, I cannot, oh gosh. So he says here, the following search terms have been highlighted, right? If I were convinced that I required such additions to the theory of natural selection, I would reject it as rubbish, but I have firm faith in it, as I cannot believe that if false, it would explain blah, blah, blah. So he would, he would reject natural selection as rubbish if he needed to include God. He had to get rid of God. And he says here, I would care nothing for the theory of natural selection if it required miraculous additions. Okay, so this is darwin-online.org.uk and you can search for a bunch of things. Okay, so you can search for, um, like you can look up, I beat a puppy. And he mentions here, oh, let me see if I can find beating a puppy. Let's see if we can find where he, ah, we'll find it later. Anyway, but you can go through his Darwin Online and you can find stuff. Okay, so natural selection is a non-random difference in reproductive output. So a non-random, so some choice was made, some selection was made, and this creates a specific change in reproductive output among replicating entities, leading to an increase in the proportion of beneficial heritable characteristics. So you decide to, to have babies with, with, with Jane, and Jane is blonde-haired, and you're blonde-haired, and your kids have blonde hair. So because of that deliberate decision, you have this non-random effect of having kids with blonde hair, not hopefully not purple hair or blue hair, but, you know, not black hair, but blonde hair. So that you carry on this idea. So heritable characteristics within a population from one generation to the next. That's natural selection. So yes, scientists do base the entire worldview of a story made up by Darwin, and we'll discuss that. So... Darwin's two major works are a set. You cannot read them in isolation, right? In 1859, he wrote On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. However, what people forget is that it has a longer title. Back then, it was very common to have long titles, and centuries before, it was even longer. But it continues, The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. He viewed life as a struggle. A struggle, tooth and claw, red in tooth and claw, fights. I've spent time in the bush in Africa. I've been around lions. I've been around elephants. Trust me, animals are not killing each other randomly at all times of the day. They aren't walking around as if w once a lion makes a hunt, makes a kill. They, they do nothing but sleep for the next three days. It's like, so it is not as bloody as people make out. It's not. So Darwin had this crazy idea that the struggle for survival is a struggle of life and death, constant violence, and this is a false view of life and a false view of nature. <coughs> S.P. Jones says, actually, it's like the dialectic materialism of Marx. Actually, that's a very good point. It's a false dialectic, but yes, it is a dialectic. Yeah, whales have vestigial limbs, therefore they are descendants of bacteria. Correct, correct. Was Darwin a Freemason? We have no evidence of that. His family certainly was. There's a... The... the According to the authors I've read, you cannot discount the possibility that he was a Freemason, but it can't be proven, it can't be disproven either. And it's very likely that he was, given his associations. So, okay, so the preservation of favored races, which means they are disfavored races in the struggle for life. In 1871, he wrote the next book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. This was written as a sequel to this one because of the response that came out of the first book. So he had to write a second one. He wrote both of these books to eliminate God. Let me be very clear about that. As we go through this, you're going to find out how just anti-Christian he was. 
Other appropriate titles for his book would have been Darwinian Evolution from, primord from Primordial Chaos to Calculated Evil. Evil by Design, The Sinister Science of Darwinian Evolution. Survival of the Sickest, Unraveling the Darwinian Science of Evil. Any of these would have been appropriate titles. Darwinian Evolution, The Science of Genocide. And it is the science of genocide. Now, Professor Lawrence Krauss, well-known atheist, says, we are, we are just a bit of pollution. If you got rid of us, the universe would be largely the same. We are completely irrelevant. That's Professor Lawrence Krauss, who obviously thinks that life is a good thing. But if he thinks you are pollution, but he's not pollution, then it's okay if you die, right? It benefits the universe because you are pollution. So this is Lawrence Krauss here, okay? So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Lawrence Krauss, in his book, A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Something Rather Than Nothing, written in 2012. Now, of course, in his book, what he says is that the universe would still have been created from nothing. Okay, God didn't have to make it because from nothing, we would have, the universe would have just randomly popped into existence. Like, in fact, you know what? Oh my God, a million dollars just appeared on my desk out of nothing. From nothing, I, I'm going to show, here guys, here's a, what? The million dollars disappeared as well. It disappeared as fast as it appeared on my desk. It, wow, it, I had the million dollars, I promise you. It appeared out of nothing. It just appeared on my desk and I was showing it to you and it disappeared from my hands. So yeah, I guess these things happen. So understand, he claims that things can appear from nothing. That is incoherent, illogical bullshit. Now, here's the thing though. When he defines nothing, he redefines nothing, just as Gnostics always do. Like atheists always do, like Muslims always do. They redefine the word nothing to mean something that contains something, right? Lawrence Krauss's nothing contains something and it has electrical fields it has so well anyway so i created a uh, so i created a story here so hold on let me just go back here my bad let me just go back to dr lawrence krauss and i want to give you something here i want to show you this so <clears throat> i wrote a little story called uh, cookies from nothing okay i want to read you a little story this is this is to illustrate lawrence krauss's fantastic idea cookies from nothing um logical fallacies and circular reasoning Critics argue that Krauss's idea of the universe arising from nothing relies on circular reasoning. They claim that he uses the existence of physical laws and quantum fields within the universe that exist now after creation to explain the origin of the universe. Right? So things that he finds in the universe today that were created by the creation of the universe are the things that created the universe. Imagine a world where a delicious chocolate chip cookie spontaneously appears out of thin air. So delicious chocolate chip cookies just appear out of nothing. According to the cookies from nothing hypothesis, these cookies materialize out of absolute nothingness, defying the laws of thermodynamics and culinary logic. Proponents of this idea of the cookies from nothing theory argue that existence of these cookies is evidence of their own spontaneous generation. Cookies can generate on their own. They claim that since the cookies themselves are made of ingredients like flour, sugar, and chocolate, which are commonly found in the world, it follows that these ingredients must have spontaneously come into existence as well. I'm not kidding you. I'm, I'm taking this guy's theory and I'm presenting you with cookies from nothing. This is the man's theory, just applied to the culinary amazingness of cookies. They further assert that the taste and texture of the cookies prove their or origin from nothingness, as they possess the perfect combination of sweetness chewiness, and chocolatey goodness that one would expect from a cookie that magically appeared out of nothing. It's a bullshit idea. This is literally what Lawrence Krauss is saying. Understand, this is, this, these are the, the universe has exactly the qualities that it, someone please make me wake up, pinch me to wake me up. Critics of the cookies from nothing hypothesis point out the glaring absurdity of such an argument. They argue that this notion relies on circular reasoning as it ex assumes the existence of pre-existing cookie ingredients in order to explain the spontaneous appearance of the cookies themselves. See, so the ingredients existed, so that's how the cookies came, but how do we get the ingredients? Furthermore, skeptics highlight the lack of empirical evidence for cookies materializing out of nothingness. While 
for instance, you know what? I've got a little bit of paper and I've got a little bit of ink on my desk and I'm waiting for that million dollars to assemble itself out of my cotton, my paper and my cookies. I've even got a printer next to me. So hopefully the million dollars will just appear because I've got ingredients for it. Actually, I've got some flour and sugar in the kitchen. Maybe if I go in there right now, there'll be some cookies just randomly appearing. While the idea of cookies appearing out of thin air may be tantalizing, it is far-fetched and lacks the necessary scientific rigor to be taken seriously. This parody argument serves to highlight the inherent absurdity in Krauss's idea by applying the same reasoning to a whimsical scenario and underscores the need for logical coherence, empirical evidence, and critical examination when evaluating scientific hypotheses, even if they seem enticing or delicious, like cookies. So guys, if you do me a favor, just leave some cookies and things out and see if you generate a magical Father Christmas or a present or something. So yeah, I hope hopefully that gave a reasonable explanation of just what the heck's going on here with this guy. So these are your atheist overlords. Um, hail be to atheism or something. Right. So religion, not welcome here. Don K. Krauss was accused of sexual misconduct, wasn't he? Interesting. <laughs> Something to say about a worldview that may precipitate such delinquency and such idiocy. I mean, man, if we, if we all got cookies from nothing, I'd save a little bit of money, right? So, yeah. So maybe Lawrence Krauss can send us some cookies. Maybe he can generate a few cookies from nothing and send us a few as proof of his, uh, you know, so guys, does this is this all making sense so far? I mean, does this all sound realistic and reasonable, what I'm presenting here? Dark chocolate chip cookies. So yeah, milk and cookies. Maybe you want milk as well with your cookies? Oh my God. Right? So hopefully, I mean, first of all, are these things that you were told about Darwin? Were these things that you were made aware of by Darwin? Or these things that just people somehow forgot to tell you about Darwin? Chocolate chip cookies in my kitchen will spontaneously disappear. You know, if I came and visited you, Marlene, I, I guarantee some of those cookies would disappear spontaneously. I wouldn't know where they went. Anyway, so religion is not welcome here. Darwin says to us, science has nothing to do with Christ. <laughs> the Ricky Brown, this is a great argument against nuts. Now, this is from Scientific American, Mind and Brain, Evolution and Angst. Charles Darwin was a warrior. The intrepid explorer and scientific maverick appears to have suffered from anxiety and panic attacks because, but fats in body will never disappear. Yes, EMB Maxim. Yeah, a moment on the lips, but forever on the hips. Yes. So understand Charles Darwin was mentally a train wreck. The man was an emotional, physical train wreck. Just like Martin Luther was actually. Martin Luther was not as, not so good together. We didn't keep it together well either. So this is from 2016, all right? So Darwin tells us science has nothing to do with Christ, except insofar as the habit of scientific research makes a man cautious in admitting evidence. In other words, science has basically disproven God, so I'm not willing to entertain evidence for, for, for God. I do not believe that there ever has been any revelation. Sister in Christ says the hips don't lie. Sadly, you are correct. That's the truest thing you've said, anyone has said the whole day. So I do not believe that there ever has been any revelation. As for a future life, every man must judge for himself between conflicting, vague probabilities. Yeah, that sounds like a solid Christian right there. Would you guys agree? This is definitely Baptist. This has that Baptist twang to it, that, that utter, complete, total faith in God. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I think we can start to eliminate and we will find far more that Darwin was very anti-Christian. This is not all that I have, but understand this just introduces the idea that yeah, he was not very Christian. So Darwinism is not a synonym for evolution, understand. Darwinism is a particular approach to the evidence for evolution. It's a perspective on the evidence for evolution, a reductionist, materialist approach that excludes the divine deliberately. So, Cross also said about his friendship with Epstein, I don't feel tarnished in a way by my relationship with Jeffrey. I feel raised by it. Of course you would. Right. So what is Darwinism? So this is from Charles Hodge. What is Darwinism? Right. This was from 1874. This is a question which needs an answer. This is the what he writes in this book. So Darwinism is really a bastardization of the previous theory of evolution. Yeah, it's it's a bastardization of a previous pagan, pagan theory of evolution. I hate when I leave my computer unlocked and it spontaneously writes a plan to overthrow the government. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm 
I'm hoping some cookies will spontaneously form in some cold milk later, but I, I, I'm going to leave my wallet out and hope it spontaneously gets filled with money. I don't know. Maybe we can try that, you know, money from nothing and your chicks for free. I mean, that's, you know, so, you know, my, one of the best bands in history can't be wrong, right? So <clears throat> what is Darwinism? This is a question which needs an answer. Great confusion and diversity of opinion prevail as to the real views of the man whose writings have agitated the whole world, scientific and religious. If a man says he is a Darwinian, many understand him to avow himself virtually an atheist. So the understanding of the period was that anyone who said he was a Darwinist was an atheist, not a Christian, an atheist. While another understands him as saying that he adopts some harmless form of the doctrine of evolution. But this is not a harmless form of the doctrine of evolution. This is a particularly toxic, corrosive, anti-Christian, anti-God view of evolution. So welcome, Arnold Nathaniel, Diane Alice, welcome, Matthew Velasquez, I want my MTV. <laughs> MTV's gone so woke, you don't want it, man. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you got the reference. <laughs> that ain't working, that's the way you do it. So, toxic cookies. Yes, Adrian, yeah, sadly, very toxic cookies. Lava, welcome. And he says, so this is, they think that Darwinism is some harmless form of the doctrine of evolution. But this is a great evil. Dire Straits, yes, XYZ. It is obviously useless to discuss any theory until we are agreed as to what that theory is. No heresy about Dire Straits, exactly. I think we can all agree they're one of the greatest bands ever, Dire Straits. Mark Knopfler, great guitar player. So, right, yeah, I think we can all agree. We, we all, we're all Dire Straitists here. So, you know, at least to some degree. <laughs> So the question he says, therefore, is what is Darwinism must take precedence of all discussion of its merits. This was a brilliant quote that this guy made. I mean, this was a brilliant piece of writing. What is Darwinism? Are we all clear as to what Darwinism is? And we need to discuss what Darwin, where's this going? Where's this idea taking us? Before we discuss its merits, we need to discuss, we need to know what it is, right? Evolution, they've been atheists when I was younger. Well, that and being raised in the Mormon church. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I've met a few good Mormons. I mean, yeah, but really nice people. Can be very nice people. This is Charles Hodge, who lived from 1797 to 1878. Let's look at Scientific American. Darwin's flatulence on modern thought. Sorry, it might have been influenced, but I, that could be a typo. Or my, um, you know, my spell checker that just decided to change words randomly. So... Dire Straits evolved a band. Well, the song evolved itself. It appeared out of nothing. Songs from nothing. So great minds shaped the thinking of successive historical periods, right? Luther and Calvin inspired the Reformation. Locke, Leibniz, Voltaire and Rousseau, the Enlightenment. Modern thought is most dependent on the flatulence of Charles Darwin. That's according to Scientific American. I don't want to call them unscientific. The discovery of natural selection by Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. So Darwin was not the only inventor of natural selection. There were two people. Alfred Russell Wallace is the other one. Must itself be counted as an extraordinary philosophical advance. The principle remained unknown throughout the more than 2,000 year history of philosophy, ranging from the Greeks to Hume, Kant, and the Victorian era. And here I must warn you, Scientific American is not just wrong they're, st they're wrong. Let's just say they're wrong, okay? They state here the idea, this natural evolution, this, this idea of evolution that Darwin presented was unknown throughout the more than 2,000-year history of philosophy from the Greeks all the way through to Victorian. That is wrong, and they know they're wrong. I, I don't know how a scientific American can get this wrong. It is a complete lie. It's a falsehood. Yet, oddly enough, the idea is present in Islam. So... I don't know if you guys know, but Darwin's idea of evolution was promoted by the Sufis and by the Muslims thousands of years, I mean hundreds of years before Darwin. This idea goes back well before Darwin. Even the Muslims had it. Even the Muslims were punting it. Even the Muslims were promoting it. Even the Muslims were writing about it. So Darwin was promoting a very Muslim idea, but this idea goes back to the Greeks. They say the Greeks that didn't have this idea, well, the Greeks had the idea. Scientific American is either deeply ignorant or they are deliberately misrepresenting the facts that's people polite because they don't want to tell people that Darwin had taken paganism 
and dressed it up nicely and slapped the word science on its butt, sent it out the door and said, hey, this is now science, except it's old Greek paganism. The truly outstanding achievement of the principle of natural selection is that it makes unnecessary the invocation of final causes. That word final causes is very important because now we're talking about Thomas Aquinas. That is, any teleological forces or purposeful forces in the universe leading to a particular end. In fact, nothing is predetermined. So here Scientific American is saying that nothing is predetermined. Everything is random. There's just chaos in the world. And contradicted by the next paragraph. So what is this is fact, this is my these are my words contradicted by the next paragraph. <clears throat> so they say nothing is predetermined, nothing is teleological, everything is just random, atoms crashing into each other, and from this train wreck you suddenly get an airport and planes and they all assemble themselves, right? Remember, airports from nothing. Darwinism rejects all supernatural phenomena and causations. The theory of evolution by natural selection explains the adaptedness and diversity of the world solely materialistically. When you put these two together, these don't make sense together, but okay, whatever. You get logic and order from utterly irrational, completely random, totally, yeah, totally disconnected events. Morals from reasoning. Yeah, so Darwin provided a scientific foundation for ethics. My last flight was assembled by a storm inside a hangar. Exactly. So Darwin provided a scientific, in fact, the last time I made tea, the sugar assembled itself randomly from the atoms and just, I had sweet tea because it, maybe next time it won't be, but yeah, that's how it happens. So understand, Darwin provided a scientific foundation for ethics. This is the claim of Scientific American. Now let's have a look at this guy. Darwinism, devaluing human life. Darwinism and death, developing, devaluing human life in Germany from 1859 to 1939. We are going to be spending spontaneous sugar tea. Yes, yes, spontaneous sugar tea. So we're going to be talking a lot about this particular dude. He's going to come up a lot and we're going to end off on him and his forebears from the First World War to the Second. We're going to find that these guys were devout Darwinists and they were genocidal maniacs to a man. So Stephen Meyer refers to a 2016 Royal Society meeting, five major problems with the evolutionary theory conclusion. We need a new different theory of evolution. Yeah, that's long been known. So, yeah, I don't want to read too much of the comments, okay, because now then this thing takes forever. But the reason I needed to do it today, and I should have, I wasn't sure I was going to do it today, is that on Thursday I'll be doing it with Kennedy Hall on his channel um, as well. So I wanted to get it on my channel first, and then my coffee made itself. Ernesto, that's great, that's great. <laughs> so let's continue. The discussion about social Darwinism has special importance. It is background to Hitler's ideology the roots of German imperialism and World War I, and also the first of the modern genocides. Hitler was a social Darwinist, and be blunt about that, Hitler was a social Darwinist. He got his ideas straight from Darwin. He viewed history as a fight for existence, as did Darwin, as we saw in Darwin's own words. Existence was a fight. Existence was where one killed the other, where the higher races killed the lower races. And this was a fight for existence among unequal races. Hitler's scholars agree on this point. Hitler's scholars agree on this point, And it is too obvious to deny when one reads Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf is one. It reads like Luther's book on the Jews and their lies. Mein Kampf is filthy. But it clearly is based on Martin Luther and on Darwin. He references Darwin way too often. Darwinism impacted thinking about the value of human life and the significance of human death, or the, shall we say, the insignificance of human death. And we must ask ourselves, are they precursors to his thought? Prominent German Darwinists urged their society to reevaluate its stance on what today is known as biomedical ethics. So before Luther, Luther's father and his grandfather, and all of the Nazis and their fathers and grandfathers, were very much engaged in the late 1800s with trying to re-educate German society on looking at things like infanticide, euthanasia, suicide, and abortion, and promoting them as natural and scientific. In fact, we should encourage infanticide, euthanasia, we should encourage suicide and abortion, because that will give us a purer race, this will improve society, it is scientific, it is good. This is where Darwinism led to murder. Uh, Marlene Stewart says, I'm impressed at how you keep up with your complex 
fact pack thesis on the chat. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I can't catch every comment in the chat, but, um, but thanks. Yeah. So leading Darwinists who are atheists, okay? In, and remember, these are atheists, and we're going to see how disgusting these people are, how vile and murderous they are. And they are atheists. Atheists need to own this. Leading Darwinist atheists invoked Darwinian science to undermine traditional Judeo-Christian ethical values. And this they did very explicitly. <clears throat> the naturalistic Darwinian paradigm, evolutionary theory in the universities, became an atheistic ideology to redefine all areas of life. Universities now teach evolutionary everything. You have evolutionary toast making. You have evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, evolutionary... You, you pick the science. Islamic origins, welcome. Hey, Mel. Is Mel around? I, did I see him? Right. So, Darwinism, the universal... I go for another couple of pages. I go five minutes, okay? Five more minutes. An hour and a quarter is good. Uh, let's see. Darwinism, the universal asset. And this is from Oxford Academic, Biology and Ideology, from Descartes to Dawkins. The ideological uses of evolutionary biology in recent atheist apologetics. Now, it's odd that Darwin was a Christian, but atheists are very much drawn to using Darwin in their polemics and in their apologetics. Now, it's crazy that they... Okay, fine, whatever, let's this continue. During the first few years from this, from this article, from Oxford Academic. Prayers and Porsches, nice, welcome. Okay, so yeah, go back to the beginning, play it at 1.75 at two speed, because I, I tend to speak at an even pace, people say. During the first few years of the 21st century, a number of high-profile populist books offering an aggressively atheist critique of religion appeared. This clustering of prominent works of atheist apologetics, because atheism is not a religion, right? Don't forget, it's not a religion, may be attributed to the fact that developments in biology, especially evolutionary biology, have profound negative implications for belief in God. So they glommed onto this. Atheists glommed onto Darwin. Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion and Daniel Dennett's Breaking the Spell, both published in 2006, argue that the Darwinian theory of evolution erodes traditional moral notions as a universal acid that dissolves every ethical and moral system it encounters. So according to Daniel Dennett and Richard Dawkins, Darwinism is a universal acid that erodes traditional ethics and morals. It destroys ethics and morals. Your, ba your baloney evolved into having a first name. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I mean, hopefully, I've, I've got some dry bread in the kitchen. I hope it evolves into a pizza. I mean, nice. I haven't had pizza in months. Um, oh, by the way, I have a new mouse. Um, actually, can I... Hold on, I forgot. You know what? I have a new mouse. That's, uh, I want to say thank you to the people who sponsor me. I'm very grateful. It's not brand new. I bought it. Um, this is a uh, a display item. So in Polish, they call it Povista Vova. So it's a display mouse. I got like, a, it's a normally like $100 for this mouse here in Europe. And I, I got like, I paid 360 for it, 370 and it's normally like 450 500 So I got a small discount. I mean, well, decent, 25% discount. So thank you for everyone. My last mouse broke, it was falling apart. And so I managed to get a decent MX Master 3S. So thank you very much to everyone. I, I do appreciate it. Um, so, Darwinism has been transposed in recent atheist apologetics from a provisional scientific theory to an anti-theistic ideology. So, so this is anti-theistic. They admit that it is an anti-theistic ideology. Darwin, Darwinism lends itself to being utterly anti-theistic. In particular, it considers the ideological use of the biological sciences, especially evolutionary biology, in recent atheist apologetics. Let me just see if I've had missed if I had missed anything. Saw you on Kennedy Hall's channel and I'm totally hooked. Thank you very much, President Porsches. Um, yeah, awesome and insightful content. Thank you. Uh, have I missed anything? Trent wasn't denying anything either. Um, yeah, I, I commented on Trent's comments on look, I don't know Kennedy that well, and I don't know what else Kennedy has done, but uh Trent Hall did mention the stuff about Luther and he dismissed it. And I, I made multiple comments to say, look, Trent, I'm sorry, but at least on the Luther stuff, Kennedy was 100% spot on. So you can't just dismiss that. Um, <clears throat> so I'll have to rewatch. It seemed like Trent Horn was rejecting the claims about Luther. Yes, he was. And I actually, they, they commented to me. Actually, they, they did 
I was responded to by one of his admins. Uh, let me show you. Ich werde euch zeigen. So, yeah. Uh, here, I mentioned this Luther and prostitutes, right, to Trent Horn on his channel. I said, um, Luther wrote in one of his very last letters to his wife, he described his inability to be sexually aroused by the sight of prostitutes, and he blamed Jews for his illness. Okay. So this is JSTOR reference, 2330274, also American historic, Historical Review and National Library of Medicine article, Martin Luther's Body, The Stout Doctor and His Biographers, by historian and Luther biographer Lyndall Roper. And then Kyle from the Council of Trent wrote, I've seen your name pop up quite a bit in these comments. I'll take a look at some of these sources you're citing, Kyle. So this wasn't Trent himself, but Kyle. So yeah, it looks like they saw my comments. So we'll see what happens. Okay, so let's continue with this. So I'll go another couple of minutes. So Darwinism gave scientific racism, which dehumanized people, the respectability and authority of science, right? So Dar this is literally what Darwinism did. It gave scientific racism and atheists are like, well, you know, science is pure. Religion is evil. We're going to see some of that through this talk. Science is pure. Science is going to save the world, right? And like religion is evil. Are you God, the horrible Christians? But scientific racism dehumanized people. It gave permission to wipe them out, which Hitler did, which the Germans did prior to Hitler. They were doing this long before Hitler came along, decades before. And evil was given the respectability of science. So I want to show you guys see Ota Benga and Rational Science. So Darwin is the universal acid that affects everything. This is a book review of Dennis by Dennis Sewell called The Political Gene, How Darwin's Ideas Changed Politics. So this guy is doing a review. So this is a review of The Political Gene, right, by Jerry Bergman. And he writes here, Darwinism's critical role in eugenics and Nazism is told in an engaging way that reads like a novel. He shows that although racism existed before Darwin, Darwinism gave the human inferior superior racial hierarchy theory the respectability and authority of science. Darwin made it okay to declare other people inferior and then go and kill them and take their stuff. This authority inspired the eugenics movement that swept the world. Darwinism is eugenics. Darwinism is social Darwinism. Understand, Darwin himself was a social Darwinist. Darwin, Darwin was a eugenicist. His family were involved. They became presidents of the Eugenic Association, right? Okay, so let me see. I don't want to go through the whole thing. Notice, Darwin's son Leonard replaced his cousin, his cousin Galton as chairman of the National Eugenics Society in 1911. Interesting. Darwin's sons were into eugenics, you see? So this wasn't an accident. Right? This was not an accident. Right? So, notice here, Sewell documents that there is no doubt about the lineage of eugenics itself. Noting that in the years leading up to the First World War, the eugenics movement looked like a Darwin family business. Because the baby murdering society, correct? Joel Thomas, the baby murdering society. Yes, so S.P. Jones, that is a very smart statement. Anything can be permitted as long as science is bolted onto it. So, yeah. See, so they say here, Sewell bends over backwards to be fair and not misrepresent Darwin, but he also tells the whole story, often sorely neglected in the literature on evolution. Darwin is a sick puppy. Believe me, this is a very sick man. He also allows the words of leading scientists such as Ernst Haeckel and Charles Darwin whose racist ideas were crystal clear in their writings to speak for themselves. So am I being biased? I mean, look, I know we're all tribal and we all want to take sides in an argument, but am I presenting a fair set of information? Does this seem credible? Darwin was a racist. Darwin was, I know people are going to say, well, he was a product of his time. So was Muhammad. Does that make it okay? Right? Jesus was also a product of his time. So in other words, did we go from great morality to racism and genocide, and both are okay because, you know, it wasn't okay to do it when Jesus was around, but by the time Darwin came around, we could kill anyone we like because product of his time. But yes, according to Darwinists and according to atheists, yes, that is the way morality works. There is no fixed morality. There's only what benefits you today. So this is the morality. This is the subject of morality that they promote. If they are true, true to themselves, they are consistent in their logic, then you'll discover these people are evil genocidal maniacs. 
So, right. So this is what he goes and says. So understand. So now I want to talk about this guy, uh, Ota Benga. So the case of Ota Benga, I want to raise this and I'll finish. All right. Sewell opens chapter one with the story of Ota Benga, the pygmy put on display in the Bronx Zoo in a locked cage with an orangutan named Dohong. They were about the same height and even their grin was similar. No doubt, many of the more than 40,000 visitors who saw who saw the exhibit on the second day alone got the point. The secretary of the zoo was an enthusiastic champion of eugenics. So these are scientists who were great champions of eugenics and he hoped to use the display to proselytize his evolutionary religion, right? And he wanted to proselytize his evolution views to the public because, well, as we know, atheism is, an, is a proselytizing religion. The display caused the crowd to ask questions such as, was Ota Benga a monkey or a man? Now, I'm black. I'm from Africa. Try that with me. Yeah, let's just say you're going to wake up in the expensive care ward and it's going to be very expensive. So the zookeeper answered that Ota was a transitional form between man and monkey, the missing link. So behold, everyone, here you have Ota Benga, the missing link between man and monkey, according to scientific atheists. Scientific. It's scientific. These guys can't be wrong because it's science. They are using science. Now, my personal response to this is F these people. Okay. But, okay, fine. I mean, seriously, this angers me. You have no idea. Ota Benga, in other words, was a transitional animal between monkey and a man, the famously elusive missing link. South African American, some African American Baptist pastors that were not very impressed with either the display of ev or evolution. Actually, about the only opposition to the display was from African, also, look, I must admit, I utterly dislike the term African American. These are black Americans, they're not Africans. They may be black, they're not Africans. I'm sorry, I'm African, you're not. Get over it. So, actually, the only opposition to the display was from African-American ministers who did not believe in evolution. The evolutionists defended the display by noting that evolution is taught in the school textbooks and is no more debatable than the multiplication table. It is not debatable. This guy's a, this guy's a monkey. Furthermore, one supporter of the exhibit, Henny Fairfield Osborne, one of the most esteemed American anthropologists of the first half of the 20th century, seemingly could not bring himself to include the African as a member of the human race at all. So, so now here, what's, what's going to happen is atheists are going to go, well, I personally, as an atheist, I do not believe in what Haney Fairfield Osborne said. I personally reject it. Therefore, all this crap is okay. Just like you're going to have Protestants will say, I don't accept Luther's views. Therefore, all this crap is just fine because I personally don't believe in Luther's views. Therefore, it doesn't matter what Luther said. It's like it's like a Nazi or, or anyone or German going, I personally don't support Hitler. Therefore, it doesn't matter what Hitler does. Therefore, Hitler becomes irrelevant. That is bullshit. So, but this is, this is, this is what passes for argument these days. Sewell adds that a century later, American vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin took the side of the African ministers in evolution, and he concludes this was a significant factor as to why she was treated so poorly by the left, the media, and academia, because the left, the media, and academia are very much into their eugenics and Darwinism. The exhibit designed to teach the public that the human is just another primate. Yes, you're just a monkey. You're just, in fact, this rock next to you might be your uncle. And it was repeated on ancestor was repeated almost a century later when three men and five women put on fig leaves and were put in a cage to frolic with apes to demonstrate the basic nature of man is an animal and that we are not that special. Remember, you are pollution according to this highly trained PhD, PhD that writes books. Right? You are just pollution. Sewell then asks, have things changed much? No, they have not changed. They've just become more quiet about it. Although the once almost universal conclusion by scientists that black people were closer in the evolutionary scales to apes than white people is seen by scientists today as a ghastly mistake. Scientists are not taking any responsibility for this mistake. Yeah, I personally don't believe in it, so it's okay. We can ignore it now, sweep it under the, sweep it under the carpet, throw it under the bus. I personally don't believe in Luther, therefore it's okay whatever Luther said. Yeah, sure. Okay, yet it traces linger in the minds of millions, infecting attitudes to race everywhere. As evidence, Sewell noted that Nobel laureate James Watson explained his gloomy prognosis for Africa's social and economic development by arguing that we could not expect that the intellectual capacities of people 
graphically separated in their evolution, should prove to have evolved identically to the level of the higher evolved, technologically sophisticated whites. So, hmm, okay, well, make of that what you will. Understand, yeah, like, make of that what you will. Sewell documents the jump of eugenics from theory to politics and control by noting that the eugenics movement required an expansion of state agencies and an expansion of their scope for prying into and ultimately directing the lives of the poor. A system will also be established for the examination of the family history of all those placed on the register as being unquestionably mentally abnormal, said Leonard Darwin, especially as regards criminality, insanity, ill health, and pauperism of their relatives. If all this were done, it can hardly be doubted that many strains would be discovered which no one could deny ought to be made to die out in the interests of the country in what Germany became a short step to the Holocaust. These are Darwin's words. We need to examine people's families to look for the poor, the lazy, the ill, the mentally unwell, and we need to let these strains of people die out. And the Nazis said, okay, thanks, Darwin. We're going to do just that. Don't forget, Martin Luther was also like all about killing the, the mentally ill or the killing the um, disabled. Luther also okayed then. He said, that's just, that's good stuff. Go for it. So look, I'm, I'll leave this here. I think I've said enough. Okay. Oh, by the way, let me, let me, actually, this is worth doing. So notice here, um, I want to talk about this. The Columbine killers. Now, I know we've all seen the, we've all seen the, we've all seen the, conspiracy theories about the Columbine killers. They were controlled by satellites in space. The aliens were sending beams into the head. The CIA had small people living inside their ears. We've all seen it. But the Columbine killers, two amateur social Darwinists. The Columbine killers were two social Darwinists. And they made similar arguments to Alvinen. We'll talk about Alvinen. So Alvinen was concerned that humans had slowed or even reversed evolution in Western society. He wrote in his blog that the stupid, weak-minded people reproduce faster than intelligent, strong-minded people like himself. Now, we've got Darwin's words that reiterate the same point, and the Nazis reiterated exactly the same point. So this guy, what he did was he went and shot a few people. He went and murdered a few people because, because of that, okay? So, and he says, Columbine killer Eric Harris wrote, wore a natural selection t-shirt on the day of the massacre. And both killers made remarks on video about helping natural selection along by eliminating the weak. I bet they forgot to tell you that in covering the Columbine killers. But understand, Darwin's ideas lead to murder. Quite bluntly. Darwin endorsed this kind of stuff. What the Nazis did was Darwinian. Based on Darwin, there is no ambiguity. There's no confusion. So, so they were controlled by... So, yeah. So, the end game of atheism. Yeah. So guys, uh, I think I'll pause here. I think I'll stop here. It's been 90 minutes, I believe, that I've gone. Um, I don't think there's a time readout here. Or the, if there is one, I don't see it right now on OBS. Let me check. Um, so guys, I'll, I'll pause here. Um, this article is called Darwin is the Universal Asset That Affects Everything, a review of the political gene. How Darwin's ideas change politics. I think it might be worth you reading this when you have some time. So... So guys, this is Darwinism. I'll end here. So did you learn anything? What did you learn from this? Right? Yes, it's nihilism, S.P. Jones. It is one hour and 28 minutes. Okay, that's great. So 90 minutes is plenty. Uh, I have a talk tomorrow evening. Um, no, no. Yeah, tomorrow evening I have a talk with um, Islamic Origins. We're going to be talking about the finance of universities by Muslims, the money that they put in, and how that, how that factors and affects negatively affects Islamic scholarship in academia. And then I've also got a talk with Kennedy Hall on Thursday. And then shortly after that, an hour later, I have a talk with Sam Shamoon as well on his channel. So I've got three live streams coming up as well. So, um, sorry. So, yeah, uh, let me see. The science goes against God is satanic. Enough said, correct. I would fully, fully agree with that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just follow the science, right? That's what the science always tells us. So, and I'm global. Thank you. Excellent stuff, Lord. Thank you. Yeah. So guys, hopefully you've learned to see Darwin in a different light. You've learned to see atheism in a different light. This is a death cult. This is a death cult. It is disgusting. It is evil. It has no respect for human life. It is directly toxic towards Christianity. It's directly antagonistic towards Christianity. You need to understand your enemies 
and you need to understand the ideologies to defeat them. People need to learn this. It is like Islam. It is evil. Darwinism leads to evil. We're going to show that very clearly. And hopefully you've learned to see Darwin in a light that has not been explained, that academia has been negligent, deliberately so, because much most of academia supports these ideas, or they're embarrassed by them. Make them public. Make them known. So, thank you, Kush. Much appreciated. Learned that Nazism has repackaged Darwinism. Yes, it's repackaged Lutheranism, and it's repackaged Darwinism. It's very much repackaged both. If an otherwise productive, upstanding citizen has never do wells in his family history, then he must be put away because of what might come forth. Does that not go against the main theory? No, I mean, so it means that the bad family needs to go, right? Um, so guys, yeah, look, I think, let, let me call it call it a night here. So, so look, let your friends know, tell them about this, please share this, learn this, use it, download the articles, read them for yourself, um, you know, post it on social media, put these quotes out there, it annoys people, it annoys the hell out of people, okay? And remember that, um, also have a look at this article here. Okay, this one, Where Was Your Church Before Luther? Have a look at this by S.J. Bonnet. I'll put a link later in the description and in the chat, in the comments, I'll put a link to this article um, so that you guys can download it and have a look through it. And yeah, I'll, I'll put it on my Google Drive and make you guys a link. Um, so yeah, guys, hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully this has been helpful. Um, thank you again for all the support on the channel. I mean, it's, things like this are expensive. It's like $100 here in Poland. I, you know, got a bit of a discount. That's great. So thank you. I have, you know, nice mouse to work with. So that's thanks to you. Appreciate it, guys. Have a good night. And I will see you guys tomorrow again. All right. Take care.